So as we've been covering here, Emmanuel Macron called for snap elections in France, which has unleashed all kinds of very interesting chaos into that political system. We're very excited to be joined this morning by Arnaud Bertrand. He has been really invaluable in terms of understanding what's going on there. He's an entrepreneur and a geopolitical analyst and hails originally from France, so has some extraordinary insights there. Great to meet you, Arnaud. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Um, let's go ahead and put this uh, tear sheet up on the screen here. We've got from the Financial Times some indications of where the polling is. Effectively, Macron's party is getting destroyed, both by the uh, far right group and by the uh, left coalition. The um, you know sort of center right party is getting even further destroyed. <laughs> They're at the bottom. There you can see as well. Uh, just give us a little bit of background, Arno, on why Macron called these snap elections, what he thought would happen, and how it looks like this is going to play out. Yeah, so uh, I mean, no one really knows why. That that's the thing. Everyone in the in the French political system is really surprised by this uh, this action by Macron. Uh, even in his own camp, there are many people on record, uh, you know, saying that was uh, a very very bad idea. Uh, so there are a lot of speculation as to why he did it. Uh, one very popular speculation is that he he, he gave an extreme short uh, time frame uh, for the other parties to organize themselves. And um, he assumed that uh, they wouldn't be able to organize themselves, um, and specifically that the left wouldn't be able to form this coalition that they, fo that they, they indeed formed, the, the, the Popular Front, as they called it. So I think his calculation was that uh, a big share of the left would join him uh, in, uh, in in a coalition in the center rather than ally with the far left. And so, you know, he will have a left center coalition and people will go uh, on, on voters will, um, will vote for that. But it didn't work out uh, that way at all. Uh, all the left uh, form this, this, uh, this um, popular front and is left in the middle with, uh, with very little support. Got it. Got it. Arno, can you tell us then about what the subsequent fallout and the implications of this policy of this election could be if the Macron party does suffer the defeat that they're expected to? Uh, so there are several possible scenarios. Uh, one scenario is that uh, either the uh, the Rassemblement National, which is Le Pen's party, wins the decisive majority in the French Parliament, or the left. Does in in that case it's uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, there is uh, a government, uh, a rassemblement national or a left government that is uh, that is formed, or there is another scenario which is that no one has a, a clear majority, uh, in which case things are much more complicated, uh, because then there will need to be some alliances between either the the rassemblement national, meaning Le Pen and Macron or the left on Macron, but both have said that they don't want to do that. And, and so we, we might, probably the most likely scenario is some sort of paralysis where no government can be formed uh, because uh, they don't want to ally with each other. And in that case, we could actually face uh, the situation where France doesn't have a government at all. And how does that work? Well, we don't know. It will be unprecedented. Mm. Uh, literally, it will be the first time in the history of the French uh, Fifth Republic. So wow. uh, we will see, I guess. Yeah. Uncharted waters. Um, talk a little bit about the way that Macron has positioned himself. Um, you know, we've talked some about his immigration positioning here. I know that's been, you know, one of the key concerns that has led to the rise of uh, Marine Le Pen's party, the the far right there. How has that played in? Has that been as central an issue as it sometimes portrayed? What's your perce perception there? Yeah, immigration is a, is a very big deal in France uh, because, uh, I mean, that's always been the big theme of, um, of, uh, of Le Pen, of course, for the past, uh, well, ever since the father. Uh, so they, they've been making it their central theme for decades, maybe 40, 50 years. And um, 
And the thing is that it, 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 it always was a, a very important preoccupation by, uh, for the French. And uh, um, election after election, the parties that got elected, always, you know, uh, fairly centrist parties, so either on, on the center left or center right, did nothing uh, uh, to to alleviate that, that, that concern by, uh, by French voter. And I think, you know, at some point people are like, okay, like we, we've, we voted for, for those parties for, for decades and uh, immigration has kept getting up and it's actually at the highest level ever uh, today under Macron. And, um, and so at some point they, you know, they decide to try the only thing that they haven't tried, which is, uh, which is the Rassemblement National. So it definitely, plays a big role, but it's not the only thing, of course. Yeah. Well, one of the things that we are wondering here is about how this will have implication also for French foreign policy. So we saw some news, we can put it up yeah. here, on the screen about the National Front and how it may, uh, they said here that the future prime minister, if elected, would end the policy of supporting the creation of a Palestinian state. Obviously, that's with respect to Israel. How would it also apply um, to the conflict in Ukraine? Uh, well, that's also rather unclear uh, because historically the Rassemblement National is uh, relatively close to Russia. At some point, they even were financed by a um, by a Russian bank. Uh, they got a loan from a Russian bank to to finance their their party because no French bank wanted to to finance them. Uh, but lately, uh, they've. Um, They've, they've done a bit the same as Meloni in Italy, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, gotten closer to NATO and, uh, uh, and um, uh, you know, backing Ukraine and so on and so forth. So I think the most likely scenario is that on that front, on Ukraine, they will turn out to be closer to a Meloni than uh, Orban in, in Hungary, for instance. Hmm. And how about with regard to Israel? What did you make of that um, shift away from a two-state solution? Yeah, so uh, in, with regards to Israel, they, they are very clearly uh, pro, not only pro-Israel, but uh, pro-Netanyahu, which would be a, a, a very, very big change for, for France's um, historic di diplomatic uh, um, position, because France has historically always been more on the side of the, the Palestinians. Uh, it's it's not for nothing that uh, you have a Jacques Chirac street in, uh, in, in Ramallah, in a, in, um, in, in, which is in the West Bank, a Palestinian city, because you know there was always that pro-Arab uh, diplomacy, di di diplomacy by by France. So it would be quite, even though Macron is already quite pro-Israel, um, uh, a Rassemblement National government would be, you know, even probably the most pro-Israel government in the world. Um, lastly, Arnaud, for an American audience, you know, we try to draw, are there any parallels here? You know, what does this potentially mean for Joe Biden, the way he's perceived? You see similar, you know, energy that led to the rise of Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders, and some of the, you know, populist directions in, in the U.S. Do you see parallels there? What are some of the lessons or potential sort of canary in the coal mines that we should be looking at here? Yes, I think. I think there are some parallels. I mean, immigration is also a big theme for, for you guys, right? Um, and um, also in general, I think at heart, uh, what, uh, what is the key issue is that you have traditional parties uh, that in France, and I think it's also largely the case in the US, have done little more than manage decline. Uh, mm. At least that's the way it's, uh, it's it's perceived by the French population. They've done little less than managed decline for for decades, and so you know year after year you see the the, the French living conditions deteriorating, especially the middle class, which is uh, which is shrinking. Um, and so, of course, you know people don't trust the, the traditional parties anymore, and we'd rather go go towards. Um, as we call it, the, the extremes, uh, because that's the only thing, again, that, that they haven't tried. And so I guess the lesson is, uh, you know, pay a lot of attention to 
looking at what people actually want, what are their real concerns, and deliver on that, because otherwise, uh, you know, they will turn for much more radical solutions. Um, well, that does sound very familiar, yes. <laughs> indeed. And you would think that would be very simple. Just well, okay, we'll look at what people's concerns are and maybe try to deliver for them. But it seems to be beyond the capabilities of uh, French leaders and American leaders as well. Arno, it's so great to meet you. Thank you so much for your analysis today. We've been we found your Twitter feed to yes. be incredibly important to our Invaluable. understanding of what's happening. We highly encourage everybody to go and follow him. Absolute Thank must you. follow Thank for so all much. geopolitical events. We appreciate you, sir. Thank you. Hey, if you like that video, hit the like button or leave a comment below. It really helps get the show to more people. And if you'd like to get the full show ad-free and in your inbox every morning, you can sign up at breakingpoints.com. That's right. Get the full show. Help support the future of independent media at breakingpoints.com.